Hey guys, this is our next fun sheet. It is PS 1.5. Use the periodic table as a model to analyze and interpret interpret evidence relating to physical and chemical properties to identify a sample of matter. Like always, lots of words. The short version is we've been talking about physical and chemical changes, and the reason we have is to learn the properties of elements. And you'll use the periodic table with their physical and chemical properties to determine which element is what. All right, I'm going to skip that. We'll come back to that later. Um, simple, basic definitions. Periodic means repeating pattern. The periodic table was invented on this velocity of the elements have physical and chemical properties that repeat in intervals, which gave us the periodic law. Ele elements fall into recurring groups, and each element has similar properties that, and they occur at regular intervals. And that's how so the scientists back in the day discovered certain elements and put them where they put them in the periodic table was based on their physical and chemical properties that repeated and made a pattern. So elements are arranged by chemical properties and by the number of electrons in the energy level. And sometimes it's called the valence level. Sometimes it's called the shell, or sometimes it's called the ring. Those are all the same words for that black circle. I put the nucleus with the protons there in the center and the neutrons there in the center. And then that black ring is an energy level. And those red circles on it are the electrons. All right, a period is the horizontal row of elements. So at that periodic table right there on the right, the numbers are there for you. I want you to go onto your fun sheet on the front side and write those numbers down. It tells the number of energy levels. So this has one, uh, let me get a pen. This has one energy level. This horizontal period has three energy levels. This has four energy levels. So that's as you go down the period and this is three all the way across. There's three energy levels on that whole row all the way across, which in this term is a period. Let me delete that. Um, label that part right there. Make sure you got that. Way to remember horizontal is like horizon. You see the horizon if you've been to the beach. It's where the ocean meets the sky. If you look out side our window and you look at the horizon, it's where the sky meets the earth. That's the horizon. Another way to remember about a period is you read and write from left to right. Just like this period uh, goes across the periodic table. It starts in the left and goes all the way to the right. And at the end of a sentence, you have a period. Well, when you read from left to right, you have a period on the periodic table. All right, group or family. Um, this is the opposite. You have a vertical column of elements. And vertical is up and down. So we're talking, oopsie, I jumped too far. Go back, go back. Um, the vertical column is like this. The way to remember vertical is different from horizontal is vertical. If you're vertically challenged, it means you're short, like me. And vertical is up and down. This column is up and down. Columns hold buildings up. Um, so hopefully that helps you differentiate those in your head. Groups show similar chemical and sometimes physical properties, like our own families. If you have blonde hair and your mom has blonde hair that's a physical characteristic you share and um, chemical characteristics are would be a little bit different for us to say we share with our families but we do when you talk about DNA and stuff um, but in a up and down column the ones the element above and below whatever element you're talking about they have similar characteristics and that's why they're in those families and they are where they are on the table all right they're numbered from 1 through 18 number that on your periodic table 
Um, I also want to take a second to point this out. This part right here, those two gray rows right there, belong in here in this section, and I'll tell you more about that again at the end when we look at a different one, but this is a good version to look at because of the color coding. They're gray and they really belong in there and everything here would shift over to make room for them. Um, but they're not there just so they don't make the table too long. All right, now we're gonna talk about each individual group. First you have your alkali metals. These are very reactive metals. They can explode when exposed to water. There's only one electron in the outermost level or shell. Um, the most reactive of this group is francium, and that's because it's in the bottom left-hand side. Um, it's number 87, and it's because of where it's located and how many electrons there are and how many shells there are. And if I drew you an example with this Bohr's model, the red and yellow is your nucleus, your protons and neutrons, and the black ring is the energy level, and that blue dot is one electron, and that's how many are in the outermost level. Now, if we're talking about francium, we would have way more rings um, because there's 87 electrons. All right, moving on. Group two, the alkaline earth metals are reactive. They have very similar qualities to alkali metals, but this time there are two electrons in the outermost shell. I think I drew it for you. Would look like that. Okay. All right. Groups three and four. Oh, excuse me. Groups three through twelve are your transition metals. They're stable. They're unreactive. They're very similar to each other. They're all solids except, like everything in science, there's always an exception. Mercury. Um, it's a liquid at room temperature and all of these transition metals are good conductors of electricity and heat. I should add that in heat. And these are the metals that you probably know the most. Copper, zinc, tin, um, aluminum, silver, gold, they're all right here in this section. Alright, group 13 through 16 are stair step metals, and um, these are metal loids, and there are six that separate transition metals from the halogen group. Actually, some um, tables include a seventh one, and I'm going to go ahead and add its chemical symbol here, but I'm not going to write it out because I do not know how to spell it off the top of my head, so... Just add that in as the seventh one, and we'll talk about it on your table when we talk about seven. Um, this group is somewhat malleable, and they're semiconductors. And if you remember when we talked about pure substances, and we talked about compounds and elements and molecules, and did that that fun sheet, we talked about metals, nonmetals, metalloids. Well, this is the metalloid section. And, oh, there's your stair step. Draw your stair step. All right, group 17 are halogen. The halogens, they are extremely reactive because they only need one electron in their outer ring. And I am going to draw you a picture of that, I think, in a second. But I'm also going to draw you, or maybe I'm going to draw you group 18. But I'm going to define group 18 for you first, and then we'll go back and talk about 17 and 18. So group 18 are the noble gases. They are unreactive. They have perfect eight in their outer shell. Oh, okay. So here is an example of neon, and neon is a noble gas, and it is in the second period, but the 18th family, and we're talking about neon, and that's what this Bohr model is representative of. So this really goes with this noble gas column right here. And if you can see, it's got two electrons in the first shell because that's the most there can be in the first shell. And then the most there can be on the second shell is eight. And this has eight. It's got a perfect number. It does not want to react with anybody because it's got everything it needs. 
Um, now, if you were talking about something in the halogen group on 17, like chlorine, let's do chlorine up here. Chlorine is in that halogen group. It's got seven on its outside shell, and it wants to react because it needs one more to have a perfect eight. So it's got two, and then it's got, you can't really see that one up there. Let me turn to change to yellow. So you've got those two in your first shell. And then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it wants to react with other things. And if you remember when I talked about like sodium chloride, it reacts great with sodium because there's only one of those electrons and that would fill that spot. And that's why sodium chloride makes table salt because they make a good combination. Chloride needs one, sodium only has one to give, and so they buddy up and make a great, a great compound. All right, moving on. Here is the square I told you we would talk about. Um, atomic number is where your protons are. And then you have your element symbols. And on your paper, there's the six. It's the carbon. And so you're going to label those parts here right now. So atomic number, fill in this part, is the number of protons. And the number of protons is always equal to the number of electrons, okay? So on your table, or on your front side of your fun sheet, you've got the square for carbon. And I want you to circle the six and draw a line out. So you've got it, and you've got the six. Circle it, draw a line out, and then label it atomic number. I kind of had to smush my C in there, but you see it. All right. Remember, protons always have a positive charge, and they live in the nucleus. All right, then you have the element symbol, which is the letter. So on yours, you have the carbon. I want you to write the word symbol next to the picture of the carbon element on the front side. Sometimes it's called the element symbol, sometimes it's called the chemical symbol. And this is the one or two letter code that tells us what the element is. Now sometimes the codes make perfect sense. Sometimes to us, they don't make sense at all. For example, this is um, argentum, and that's the Latin term is argentum, and it is the translation translation for argentum is shiny gray stuff. So shiny gray stuff to us is actually silver, and so back in the day when this metal was found, though, that's what they called it, and so that's why its letters are A G. Remember, if it's one letter, it's going to be capitalized, like carbon. If it's two letters, the first will always be capitalized, and the second will always be lowercased. All right. Then you have your atomic mass, and on your carbon on the front, I want you to write it in. It's 12.01 in case you can't see it, and I want you to label that as atomic mass. Either circle it or put a square around it and draw a line to it and say it's atomic mass. And the atomic mass is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. And we're going to talk about that in a second. But if you just look at this right here, if this atomic number is the number of protons and the atomic mass is the protons plus the neutrons. You know you're going to have to do some math here to figure out how many neutrons there are, right? All right. Um, the atomic mass is also the average mass of the element of all silver. All right, so now to find... I have to do a little math. To find... Um, the number of neutrons, you subtract the atomic number from the atomic mass. 
So for example, carbon's atomic number is 6, and its atomic mass is 12.01. And I circled it and drew that arrow down below because sometimes you see it down below, and sometimes you see it up there in the right-hand corner, and I just want to point that out. It's still the atomic mass. Anyways, so you take 12, which is the number of protons, and then you subtract the atomic mass. And this should not say protons there. I mean neutrons. That should say... Oh, yes, it should. Sorry. And then that gives you your number of neutrons. In this case, they're the same. But in like lithium's case, for example, you have the atomic mass is 6.94. We're going to round it up to 7 for simplicity's sake. And then you have 3 for the atomic number. And if you subtract them, that gives you 4. And so that's how many neutrons there are in the nucleus with the protons. And um, the reason the neutrons are important and they have no charge is because when we draw this model and you look at it, if you had two magnets and you put them together, you know how they repel from each other? Well, that's what the two positive charges would do. They would repel from each other, and they wouldn't be able to stay in the nucleus. So the neutrons are in there to help them stay in place and keep them from not repelling out of the nucleus. All right, and then we've got another example of the periodic table. And I just want to review the things you already added to yours and add a couple more things. First, you need to make sure you numbered the period going down the side right here. And then you need to do the family or the groups across the top. Okay. And then right here is our stair step in the bright yellow. And here's the one I said I wanted you to add. Make sure you add that one. And so this, let me see what I did. Okay. So those are, those four and those three um, are the stair steps. And remember, those are the metalloids or the, the metalloids. They're the things in, that separate the metals from the nonmetals. And then the light yellow that I have sort of outlined in a rectangle, that's your metals. And then I'm going to show you the bright yellow is the metalloids. And then over here I'm going to color blue. Those are your nonmetals. So that's those areas there. Um, I'm also showing you again those fit in right there. And that would shift all of those elements over to the right. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 spots. Would shift this table over 14 spots so that could fit in there, like the big carrot. 57 to 70, this one's 57, this one's 70, this one picks back up at 71. And remember that these, what they have in common is with each other, and they're radioactive which all these other ones are not, and that's another reason why they took them out, okay? And we will start the fun of the periodic table.